Welcome back to the program. Well, the Coalition today have certainly been talking about some of Labor's problems in terms of making their numbers add up and the size of the so-called black hole in their funding and in their spending commitments. We've heard more announcements today from the Labor Party, over $2 billion worth of spending in the health space. We're going to talk about some of that now with the campaign spokesperson for the government, also the Finance Minister, Senator Matthias Gorman. Thanks for your company. Good to be here. What do you make of Labor's promise to spend more on Medicare? It is upward of $2 billion that they pledged this morning. Well, look, during this campaign, we will see uh, Bill Shorten make unfunded spending promise after unfunded spending promise. But uh, spending promises without explaining how you're going to pay for it, uh, pay for them, uh, are completely meaningless. I mean, Bill Shorten, as, we, as this campaign unfolds, we can really see that Bill Shorten is just uh, following the same old formula that Kevin Rudd followed in. Uh, 2007. He too uh, promised the world in health uh, and uh, when he came into government uh, promised uh, next to nothing. And, and of course uh, Kevin Rudd also in 2007 uh, promised the world when it came to being strong and tough on border protection, promising to turn back boats and when he came into government uh, he uh, welcomed uh, back uh, the uh, people smugglers. But you say that they haven't got a way of paying for it. They say that they're paying for it uh, by not proceeding with the company tax cuts. Is that fair? Well, if you look at uh, all their uh, promises so far, all their spending promises, all of the various promises they've made, they're billions and billions of dollars behind. You've got to remember, uh, they uh, have opposed in the parliament about $20 billion worth of uh, budget improvement uh, measures that are there for all to see in black and white. They've made uh, billions and billions of dollars of additional promises. Uh, and, uh, you know, even though they have uh, uh, so far stated that they would increase uh, taxes by more than $100 billion dollars, uh, over the next decade, there's still billions and billions of dollars behind. Now, uh, you know, Chris Bowen today was completely uh, inconsistent too. I mean, he was saying in the same sentence that uh, our uh, enterprise tax plan, our 10-year enterprise tax plan to boost uh, growth and to boost jobs uh, was unfunded, only then to turn around in the same sentence and to say that they would use that money that supposedly isn't there to pay for their uh, promise uh, to uh, increase uh, you know, Medicare funding. I mean, it, it just doesn't add up. Uh, Labor doesn't know how to add up uh, the numbers. Labor doesn't know how to manage uh, money. And that is, uh, of course, why uh, they uh, got the budget in such a mess when they were last in government. And we're also standing by for a Scott Morrison, another Scott, Scott Morrison media conference where undoubtedly, Senator, he will uh, continue to, to make this point about the funding issues that the Labor Party have. And we're going to see PFO tomorrow as well. But let me just ask you this. Uh, there's been some suggestion that the Coalition might be pushing a border protection agenda uh, as some sort of way of walking away from talking about the budget that was only handed down recently. Uh, what do you say to that? Oh, well, that is just completely wrong. Uh, the Prime Minister, the Treasurer, myself, uh, all of us in the Coalition every single day are out there uh, promoting our national economic plan uh, for jobs and growth. We are uh, out there every day explaining uh, why, uh, given the global economic headwinds, given the ongoing pressures in the global economy, uh, that it is uh, important for Australia to continue to successfully uh, manage uh, our transition from uh, resource investment driven growth to broader drivers of uh, growth in a strong and diversified economy. Now, we obviously don't control the questions we get in these sorts of interviews. We don't control the questions we get uh, in our various doorstops. So to a degree, you're guided by that. But our focus every single day uh, is on explaining uh, to the Australian people the importance of our plan for jobs and growth and pointing out uh, that Labor doesn't have a plan for the economy, doesn't have a plan for growth. Uh, they just have a plan for higher taxes, which would hurt. Uh, jobs and growth and which would uh, reduce the opportunity for people across Australia to get ahead. Just finally, Senator, I wanted to get your reaction to how you think uh, the release of PFO uh, will impact on both the government's, you know, I guess, election campaign, but also the Labor Party's election campaign in terms of uh, what you're both seeking to spend. Now, presumably it won't be that different to the budget, but there have been some, uh, some, some various data that have come in since the budget which may well change some of the under line assumptions when PFO comes down. What impact do you think that's likely to have both on your side and on the Labor side? Well, look, I mean, the budget was delivered just over two weeks ago, so you're right. I wouldn't expect there to be uh, material uh, changes between uh, the uh, forward estimates in the budget and the forward estimates uh, numbers uh, in the pre-election economic and fiscal outlook. But, of course, I mean, the pre-election economic and fiscal outlook under the chart of budget honesty is uh, delivered uh, independently by the secretaries of uh, Treasury uh, and Finance, and uh, they have announced that they will 
be releasing uh, that tomorrow. And uh, you know, the numbers, uh, you know, I would sus I would expect uh, will show that the government uh, has been uh, controlling expenditure, has been uh, putting the budget on a more sustainable foundation for the future by putting us on a believable trajectory uh, back to balance. And uh, just one, uh, one extra question, if I can. Uh, the front page of The Australian today is splashed uh, with this story about David Feeney. Uh, it looks like a rebounding of the politics of envy is what's happening to the Labor Party here. I mean, uh, Bill Shorten has been uh, keen and regular, along with his shadow ministers, to poke and needle at Malcolm Turnbull because of his wealth, uh, to sort of suggest that the government's opposition on negative gearing has been driven by some sort of, uh, you know, sort of wealthy world view or wealthy person's world view. Yet here we have a pretty extraordinary set of details that are coming out. It's not just the lack of disclosure with David Feeney. It's not just the fact that he didn't turn up to his interview yesterday with Laura Jays on the very day that this happened. It's not just that one of his MPs in a neighbouring seat who was supposed to be talking to me this morning all of a sudden was unavailable. I'm sure that that was no coincidence either. It's now also that it looks like there's a, a property that he's bought off Kathy Jackson. Uh, he's got a, a trust in his wife's name uh, about the house that he lives in in Canberra, which then obviously he's able to take travel entitlements for. Now, Look, different MPs have used this in different ways. I mean, I guess this is my question. Do you worry that when Labor decides to prosecute a campaign around the politics of envy, that you then end up with it getting flung around all the time? And that is essentially what is now being rebounding on David Feeney. I don't like this when it happens in either direction, but in a sense, you reap what you sow uh, if you're the Labor Party and you're now dealing with this around one of their senior shadows. Uh, well, I mean, you're certainly right when you, when you suggest, which I think you're suggesting, that Bill Shorten has been running a, a reckless, uh, divisive, uh, class warfare uh, type uh, campaign. Uh, Bill Shorten has been taking uh, the Labour Party uh, to the left. Bill Shorten has been uh, putting the Labour Party on a unity ticket uh, with the Greens when it comes to pursuing an anti-business, anti-investment, anti-jobs, anti-growth uh, agenda and their uh, ill-thought-out and reckless uh, policy when it comes uh, to negative gearing has been uh, exposed for all of the hypocrisy that it came with uh, because, uh, you know, under Labour's policy, uh, you know, Labour members of Parliament will continue to be able to uh, get ahead by uh, taking advantage of negative gearing in relation to existing investment properties they hold, uh, but they want to take that opportunity away from uh, people across Australia, from mum and dad investors across Australia. Now, the truth is that negative gearing is an opportunity that people use to leverage the value of their house, to leverage their existing income, to invest in income producing or appreciating uh, assets, whether that is a small business, whether that is into shares, whether that's a commercial property or indeed an existing residential property. Now, the Labour talking points yesterday were suggesting that somehow uh, we were advocating for Labour to make their negative gearing policy retrospective. Well, no, that's, that's wrong. Let's be very clear. Uh, our proposition to the Australian people is that, uh, uh, retro that the negative gearing policy the Labour Party uh, has uh, put forward should not proceed, it should be scrapped, uh, and that the current arrangement should continue. That is the policy that we're pursuing because we understand that it is a way for mum and dad investors uh, to, uh, to get ahead. I thought it was a funny moment recently when David Feeney was interviewed and he thought he had the interviewer by responding and saying, well, hang on a second, I'm supporting a policy that doesn't help my financial position. Well, actually, grandfathering means that it does. We're out of time. Senator Matthias Cormann, always appreciate your company. Thanks for joining us again. Always good to talk to you.